Eric Jarvis. Yes, uh, when I go to places, I can't recognize everybody. So, uh, when I was 19 years old, uh, my father came back to live with me and my grandfather for the first time in 10 years. Um, basically, he was living in uh, caves doing some experiments. Uh, you have to understand, my father was a scientist of some sorts, uh, and he had some unconventional ways about him. And to understand that, uh, you have to understand my family history. Uh, I was born in Harlem, that's where my parents lived. Uh, their parents came from the South during the Great Depression years to, uh, to the great city of New York. Uh, and their ancestors were basically uh, slaves on the plantations in the South, the Deep South. Uh, African American ancestors, Native American, actually for thousands of years. Some European migrants in my family as well. And, um, <coughs> All through these generations, many generations, uh, there's been a big struggle in my family, as there are in many families from that kind of background. And my father, uh, in this you know, 1900s uh, generation, basically had some talents. And he was seen as a child prodigy who was going to uplift the family out of this many generations of economic and psychological poverty. Um, <coughs> And uh, to understand that, for example, my father had skipped, or was skipped, two grades, two different grades during elementary school. Uh, at the age of 10, he was uh, trying to uh, redo Einstein's theory of relativity, uh, <laughs> reprove it at least. Uh, <clears throat> he entered a high school of music and art, uh, became a good pianist, uh, was a very good singer. And at the age of 15, graduated high school and entered the City University of New York to uh, become a chemist. So you can imagine the, uh, the expectations that were there. Um, so uh, while he was in college, or soon around that time, he got married, had four children, joined civil rights movements, uh, joined the um, Black Panthers. Uh, it was the 1960s, you see. Uh, got into drugs, but he got into drugs in a different way. Um, he actually, you know, in his chemist, uh, training, learned how to synthesize LSD and cocaine and all the others. <laughs> yes. And, um, and he also emerged himself in his own experiments. For example, uh, when I was his child, uh, one day he sits me down on the floor, uh, cross-legged, sits himself down, puts a eight to eight, uh, what is this, reel to reel tape in between us and starts to proceed to take these drugs like LSD and asked me to observe him, okay, and to take notes. Now, I was just beginning to learn how to write at this time. I didn't know exactly what to write. He says, well, just remember it and report back to me. And I said, why? What's, what am I supposed to be looking for? He says, well, um, with these drugs, so theoretically, supposedly, your mind is supposed to go to some other dimension of time and space. And he wanted to go to this other dimension to try to capture some of the fundamental laws of nature and physics. And I was supposed to be the observer. And in case I didn't catch anything, the eight to eight real tape was supposed to record him. And you know, well, a six-year-old child uh, doing this, I, I was pretty fascinated. <laughs> and so, um, <clears throat> so there I'm watching, I don't really see much happening. But it certainly got me thinking and interested in science and even how the brain works and, you know, wow, the brain could really do this to go to some other dimension of time and space. Uh, so my father was like this. Uh, and there were many other things about him that uh, really wasn't conducive to being a, you know, typical father, uh, such that uh, my mother decided one day to pick up and leave with the four children. Um, <coughs> and ever since that time, uh, I had seen my father on and off uh, in coming in and out of our lives. I lived with uh, my grandparents on either side of my family, but really didn't see him that much. Uh, and eventually I got uh, uh, interested in my own career. Uh, we were really pushed uh, to uh, pursue a career early in life. And I entered the High School of Performing Arts in New York City, kind of following my father's steps and my mother's as well. She was a musician. And uh, there <coughs> uh, I became a dancer. 
I actually went to the Alvin Ailey Dance School. I was on scholarship at the Joffrey Ballet as well. And towards the end of my high school years, I um, was asked by the Alvin Ailey School, or company really, can I audition for the company? Uh, so I thought, okay, I'm doing relatively decently. But I really had an epiphany at that time, and I decided, you know, what am I going to really do with my life? And something came to me that my mother always pushed, which was do something that has a positive impact on society. And I thought I could do that as a scientist. Uh, and I knew something about science because of my father's immersion into his own self. And so <clears throat> I chose science, went to the uh, City University myself, Hunter College, and in that first year, while I was a freshman, one day I walk home, well, I come back home, uh, living with my grandfather, and uh, there was my father sitting in the kitchen. I was completely shocked, um, because you have to understand, uh, well, you don't understand, but I'll tell you, <laughs> my grandfather um, was the type of person who grew up in the ghettos in uh, the Bronx uh, and raised himself up from being a poor African-American man uh, to a person of you know, high respect, uh, district uh, director or customer, director of customer services for the New York City Postal System. And he's considered my father who had all this talent and destroyed it, divorced and so forth, and get, got into drugs as a failure. And so uh, he didn't really want my father around. And so why was my father here? Well, it turns out uh, that that time that he came to live with us, uh, I asked, what happened? Well, he had been living in caves for the past six years. Um, <clears throat> now, for that six-year period, you have to, one thing that happened is that I would hear people tell me, I had seen your father in Central Park, homeless, on the bench with uh, bags. He looked like a bum. And so this is the vision that I had for that six-year period. And here he is uh, in my, in my uh, house. And so he said, yes, he was homeless. Uh, but he got tired of that type of living and decided that uh, one day he wanted to really do something significant with his life. And so he picked up his bags, his belongings, and began walking from the Central Park, mid-Central Park, to the end of Central Park, to the end of Manhattan, to upstate New York, walking for two weeks, until he got to upstate uh, New York uh, and found some caves to live in. Uh, now, he was able to survive for that period of time because he was uh, trained as a Boy Scout troop. And so he fed himself by knowing which berries and plants to eat from, uh, by killing squirrels, uh, eating them. He even told me he saw a mountain lion one time. Uh, these are small mountain lions that are upstate New York. They actually, they exist up there. And so, um, and what was his purpose? His purpose was to understand how did humans invent civilization? How did we come up with the origins of language? The origins of religion. He wanted to experience this firsthand to make to a discovery of how uh, religion and language uh, evolved. And the only way he figured he was going to do that was to experience it himself. And so, uh, <clears throat> you know, I asked him a bunch of things he learned for the sake of time. I can't go into everything, but it, it was amazing to me that uh, someone could actually do this. But he had to get back into society. He came back to the city, but he didn't quite come back to the city. He went to Inwood Park, uh, where many of you, or many of you don't know, there are some caves up there as well, some old ancient... Indian caves, where he then ended up living as well, in Inwood Park and Highbridge Park at the tip of Manhattan. Uh, in the meantime, um, <clears throat> while all this is going on, uh, my grandfather you know, had been s saving up money from some disability uh, payments he was getting over that six-year period. And my grandfather saw my father just sitting around uh, for this one year, even though I was talking to him and so forth, and just couldn't stand it anymore, and told him he has to go back on his own. Here's the $10,000, go find a place to live. My father took the $10,000 and went on an Amtrak train trip around the country to go see the La Brea tar pits and the fossil remains there and so on. Um, <clears throat> he came back to New York after that and went back to the caves in Inwood Park. Uh, he used to say to him, apartments are just caves on top of caves and people don't really see what the real world is like. Um, <clears throat> 
But he also said, I don't know if my psychosis belongs to me or the society in which I live. And so eventually he did uh, integrate partly back into society, uh, living with an uh, assisted living group that uh, had shelter apartments for the homeless. In the meantime, I go back to the lab and I work feverishly, spending the nights in the lab, uh, uh, doing lots of research. Uh, I published uh, six papers as an undergraduate student at Hunter College, and um, <clears throat> even gave my father one of them one time uh, before he had left. Uh, and during that time, uh, I had you know, wondered what is happening to him. And eventually then I got into uh, graduate school at the Rockefeller University here in New York City, uh, and began research towards my PhD. And I was thinking, I'm going to make this. I'm going to not be the failure that my father was, and I'm going to succeed at trying to do what I was doing. And one day, when I came home from the lab, and I mind you, I got to tell you how hard I worked. Actually, to do my PhD thesis, uh, to write it up, I spent 30 days in the lab, sleeping there, uh, to finish that. So, in a way, the cave was my lab or the lab was my cave, I should say. And so one day I came home from my cave, and uh, while I'm about to walk into uh, the, my door, two uh, plainclothes detectives come up to me, and they ask me, um, do you know James Jarvis? And I say, yes, uh, that's my grandfather, why? Well, um, he was uh, killed yesterday. And I said, no, I, I, I said, no, that's not true, I mean, that my, for grandfather, he died six months earlier. And they said, no, 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 this is a different, must be a different James Jarvis, uh, th because he, this is in six months ago, we're sure this was yesterday. And they pulled out an ID, and I looked at it, and it was my father, James Jarvis Jr. And um, it was pretty shocking to me at the time. He was 44, and I was 24 at the time. And uh, to take put it all in perspective, uh, <clears throat> a num number of people had died in my family at the time. My father's, uh, one of my father's best friends from high school, he was shot a year earlier. Uh, my uncles had died who were my, brother, my grandfather's brothers. And so people were wondering, who's going to be next? They thought it was going to be me. Um, and so then I proceeded to dig into my father's life, uh, went to where he was staying, and found he had few possessions, but some, one of the possessions that really touched me most that he had carried with him to the caves was my first scientific publication. And, um, excuse me, and uh, he had his rocks, his fossils, a few uh, uh, magazines, a Scientific American, a cutout from Scientific American magazine that one day I asked him, why were you doing this? And it was a rock, it was a round rock on a cliff that hit the head of a caveman sitting on another rock and said, duh, the wheel, the invention of the wheel. <laughs> he wanted to figure out how that happened. And uh, it turns out that he apparently was killed by teenagers as a gang initiation rite, sitting next to one of the caves that he used to live in, in Highbridge Park. Uh, and uh, they th the investigators think that the teenagers did not, uh, these teenagers did not value the life of a person who looked like they were homeless. And so, <coughs> uh, so after all that happened, uh, and I you know, tried to overcome this, and thinking, am I next? I wondered, am I going to make it? Is it? And my mother is also wondering this, and the rest of my family is wondering this. And so I proceed to feverishly again work in my laboratory, now as a graduate student, um, <clears throat> before my time comes. And uh, to accomplish what I like to do on this planet before I leave. And uh, ended up doing you know, some decent work, uh, made some discoveries about the relationships of bird brains and music with uh, <laughs> <laughs> language brain pathways in us, uh, eventually uh, also got a uh, position at the Rock of Duke University Medical Center, where I became a professor, and um, <coughs> uh, made some changes, well, along with the whole consortium of scientists, at bringing together our understanding of the relationship of other animals and us, 
and showing that we are not so different, including like Alex, it's Bird, uh, Irene Pepperberg's uh, uh, Bird Alex. And so, um, <coughs> all during that time, you know, my father was in me, I realized, because I would actually take our work to the actual environment. So we discovered these song learning brain areas and hummingbirds, and to do that, we actually studied the birds in the wild and studied the genes being regulated in those brains in wild birds uh, to uh, find out they're actually similar to brain pathways for us for this speech, what I'm doing now. So <coughs> um, all that, during that time, I was winning awards. Uh, we were getting some good recognition. I finally felt something is happening. Uh, and recently, I got an award at uh, Duke University. Uh, you know, they give it to one person a, a year, and I thought, okay, this is nice. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm making some milestones here, although I feel like we haven't really done what I set out to do. And the uh, chancellor of the uh, medical center comes to me during the ceremony and says, Eric, I knew you were going to do something like this, uh, because when I first interviewed you for the medical school, you, you were just so unconventional. You just did things differently. Um, and, uh, and I kept thinking, what is different? And I realized it's the way my father had instilled that immersion into your work into me. Um, <clears throat> so, but the milestone that I really think about now happened this year. This year I turned 44. And I never knew if I was going to make it. Um, and it's a really, um, uh, uh, was a real struggle for me. And it's really the first time I'm talking about it in front of this a group of people like this. Um, but I realize that's my personal milestone that I have given to myself. And I just hope that uh, whenever we do something that uh, has some kind of impact, that I can say that uh, maybe I am like my father to a certain degree where I have one foot on the grid and one foot off the grid. And I don't know if he would have done that, uh, what kind of... Uh, you know, contributions he would have made to society. But I really hope that, uh, you know, that we can do this and that um, I'm going to be able to uh, bring his legacy further, but with me. And I thank you for your attention. Yeah.